Good evening and welcome to the March 22nd, took me a second, sorry about that, March 22nd uh, meeting of the Foxborough uh, School Committee. I'd like to welcome a number of people um, in, the, in the gallery this evening. And it uh, looks like nobody, I, I didn't even check, excuse me one second, thank you. Um, I do not know if anyone here, here is uh, signed in to participate as part of the open public comment no. portion of our agenda. No. no. Okay, so we will move on. Uh, already ahead of the game with the agenda, so that's great. Um, next on our agenda is approval of minutes. We have several sets of minutes in front of us. Uh, minutes from uh, the February 8th, 2022 school committee meeting. Um, any questions or comments um, on those minutes? No, so we, may we have a motion to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve the February 8th minutes. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you very much. All in favor? Three, zero, one abstaining. Um, I just should also mention for the record that Michelle Raymond was not able to join us um, this evening. So um, I just wanted to make note of that. Thank you. Next uh, is the, are the minutes from the uh, February 14th meeting. Uh, any questions, comments, or edits on those minutes? None. None. Okay. I move to approve the February 14th minutes. Thank you very much. I second. Thank you very much. All in favor? Four zero zero. I, this is a model of efficiency. Yeah. Let me just... We're ahead. Came That's to play, right. baby. Came to play. Okay. Thank you. We're flying, flying. Next on the agenda is our teaching and learning highlight. Dr. Burdos, Dr. Mello, I don't know who wants to make I, the introductions for us. I will start a little bit, but I'm going to ask them to come up to the um, visitor table, and then we'll have Mr. Michael Lazik give a little bit more of a more specific introduction. So if he can come up, we have some of our, our fabulous service providers here with us this evening as our teaching and learning highlight. And they're going to be talking about some things from going even back to as far back as the summer and curriculum work and changes in service delivery of what it's looked like. We know that this has been a year like no other and that meeting the needs of students and being able to meet many more needs of students. You've been able to do that with some of um, the different service delivery methods that's new this year. So I don't know, um, Mr. Michaelazic, if you wanna give a little bit more of a background. Sure, good evening. So I'm here with, uh, they can introduce themselves, but I'm here with some members of our related service team who are by far the most stellar and remarkable related service providers I've ever worked, I've ever worked with. Um, what they've been able to do at the start of July 1st, 2020 to where we are now has been instrumental uh, for the support of our kids, the support of our families. Uh, and so some of the work started over the summer uh, on our speech and OT curriculum and specialized curriculum, uh, building in some scope and sequence with some targeted support for our kids. And then transitioning that, I mentioned at the last year at the special education update in regards to a service delivery change when it comes to related service, which is a 3-1 model, which they will discuss uh, much more in depth than I will. But uh, they, they've been able to make some some big changes, uh, and big changes that are leading to great results for our kids when it comes to special education programming and services. So, Pam? Absolutely. Hi, Pam Bartolini, speech pathologist. I work um, at IGO. Primarily, I also um, work with the Developmental Learning um, Learning Center, uh, six students at Burrell as well. So um, get to go a little bit different places. I've been, I've, I have experience at the other buildings as well. Um, mostly I've been at IGO for the past, since 2013, however many years that's been, <laughs> eight years, whatever it's been. Um, in terms of when we look back to about this time last year, you know, we were kind of in, still in the throes of pandemic learning and um, the hybrid model, and I think we were not even back to full in person yet. But you know, over the course of um, last school year and through the years before, you know, we've always speech pathology, occupational therapy, physical therapy. We've always worked very closely with one another in terms of our disciplines, and you know, we've done co-treatments to really help with integrating the different skills for the children, both in terms of their communication, their fine motor, their gross motor pieces as well. A lot of the kids find it super motivating too to be able to work on those skills simultaneously, um, and. Over the years, we've accumulated a lot of resources, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is wonderful, and it's so fantastic that our administration is always supportive in terms of any requests that we have, uh, you know, the supplies that we might think we need, or new resources that are coming out, which is great. Um, through last year, we particularly were acquiring a lot of 
electronic resources, which is awesome because not only were we able to use them for students who we were seeing remotely, but we were also able to use them in person on the smart board and things like that. Um, and it was engaging. Um, but you know, we really found that there was a need to kind of take a step back and look at exactly what we have and put together some kind of a curriculum in that regard. And you know, it's, it's not the same as, you know, um, science or ELA or social studies where you have a set curriculum. You know, our services are highly individualized for student need. That being said, it, within each of the disciplines, we do have, you know, certain targeted skills and kind of like more broadly speaking. And then, you know, within those skills, different students are working on different sub skills. Um, so we thought it would be helpful to put together a resource that we could have that would um, you know, separate out you know different different themes because um, there's a lot of evidence behind um, using themes in your therapy, for, especially for speech, in terms of increasing vocabulary development and helping with um, organization um, of semantic networks to help with word retrieval and expression. Um, so you know, thinking about different themes, looking at the course of the year, and then within each of those themes, going through different um, areas for each of the disciplines for what are some resources we have, where are they, um, if they're physical, you know, which building are they in? So if I'm at IGO and I'm getting kind of bored of some of my activities, I can go see, well, what do they have over at Taylor and can I ask my colleague if I can borrow that for a little bit? Um, so we were able to, last summer, a few of us um, worked together to put together a spot curriculum and it kind of um, grew to not only being about, um, you know, what is a general scope and sequence for the disciplines as we look through the years, we look at our student needs and you know, the, the types of resources that we have. It also became um, a, a nice like hub for all of um, the visual supports that we have. Um, we are using it for um, ongoing collaboration. Um, Abby and I work closely together with the students um, in the DLC. So we keep our meeting notes there. We have bi-weekly related service provider meetings which um, we keep our meetings notes in there as well. Um, there's a wide range, and Abby will speak a little bit more about the implementation, but it's become um, just a wonderful resource that we spent a lot of time and thought on over the summer, and it's been super helpful. We had um, in August on one of our professional development days, the related service providers all got together and um, we were able to go through it. Other people were able to, you know, that weren't part of the team necessarily, were able to share their ideas, um, make some adjustments in that moment. And it's been very well received um, by all of us. And we've been able to use it to assist with some of the general educators as well. So Abby, I know you're going to talk a little yep. more in depth about the implementation yep. of that. So for some of the things we've been using it for is can just... Can you move our, your mic you over? Need, you need a microphone. Oh, yeah, maybe so. come Sorry. Move. You're fine. Um, you know so I some of the things that we have used it for is just, as Pam mentioned, some of those creating our treatment plans. So when we're prepping, um, a lot of us are on the run frequently. So if we can have a general hub for that information, we can come up with a baseline plan, but then we also have access to all of those resources. We know where they are, we're not digging through files, we can print it out a little bit more simplic simplicity to it. We can also share, because for myself, um, Carrie LeBlanc, who is the other occupational therapist in district, um, she's primarily at the IGO. Um, we also have another therapist who has joined us as a long-term sub. So it allows all of us to kind of have access to that stuff in the moment and not taking that extra step to be calling each other saying, hey, do you have this? Or, um, and with the OneDrive, it's a nice active um, environment that we can keep adding and flexing to all of the time. <coughs> Um, another area that we've been adding in is, as Pam mentioned, the visual support. Um, one of the, um, well, the specialists or, I guess, consultants <coughs> that the district was kind enough to um, have come in and give us some professional development last year is um, our two people who work to develop the CERTS model. So that stands for social communication, emotional regulation, and transactional supports. And a huge piece to that model is the implementation of the different transactional supports, such as visuals. Um, and a lot of the discussion around that is keeping them kind of similar as you transition and then eventually working to fade. Because um, as one of our other consultants 
mentioned, you know, if you've been using a device, whether it's a wheelchair, whether it's crutches your whole entire life, when you switch schools or switch grades, you're not just gonna take that away from them. We needed that common place to have that visual. So as we get going for those transitions from preschool to elementary, <coughs> elementary to middle school, middle school to high school, we have that hub for all those resources and those visual supports um, so that they're in a location that we can access them or share them with everybody else in the district so that the follow through and that carryover is there. Um, and that's a really important thing. Um, along with that model, our related services we were trained in that, but also some of the other special education teachers were trained in that model too. Um, and then we as a group for the related services have also been working to continue to implement using some of those strategies. Um, and that's where we've been sourcing some of those visuals again that we're using across different um, grade levels. Um, the other thing that we've been working on is continuing to develop it for the future. So looking to add higher level activities for the high school and the middle school. Um, you know, they have found a lot of wonderful speech resources that are engaging that can use um, technology within the school. Previously it was for when we weren't fully at school, but also that's more engaging for those upper grades because after a while they get sick of listening to us talk um, and it's a little more engaging when they can do things a little more independently via technology or things like that. Um, you know the other thing is we've been putting in a lot of our training so we're trying to take notes we're documenting so that as we have new staff come on board um, we recently hired a new speech therapist within the district so it has an access point for them to access we can share it with them but then they also have the ability to go back and review all of those supports as well um, and just kind of helps keep us all on the same page and on the same page across the district. Uh, thank you, Abby, for giving us some more about that. So this, um, all this work that we did with the SPOT curriculum, Speech OT was the name we kind of coined for it, um, we also started working at about this time last year on looking at our models for service delivery in the district. And, you know, our students across all three disciplines, they require direct teaching and direct support from us. And oftentimes, we do need to see them outside of the classroom in order to provide uh, that direct instruction. That being said, the point of us seeing them is not only for them to do the gross motor or fine motor or speech and language skills when they're with us, we want them to be carrying over and generalizing these strategies across their school day so they can access the curriculum and participate within the life of the school as well. So um, when we were looking at service delivery models, there's um, an evidence-based model that's called the three to one model of service delivery. So essentially if you look at a month, which in most places, a month is four weeks, but in Foxborough, a month is four cycles because we have our six-day <laughs> cycle schedule. So if you consider you know, the four cycles of a month, um, for three of those four cycles, those are direct service periods. And during those times, we are seeing the students for direct instruction to practice the skills specifically on their IEPs. The fourth cycle is um, an indirect service period. And within the indirect service period, that allows us to do other activities related to their education. Um, so that may be that we are working with them um, in the classroom um, at a specific point in time that you know may, may not be the 12 to 12.30 time block on day one that I see them because I want to see them during morning meeting and see if they're using their augmentative communication device with their peers at that time, for example. It allows us to be more flexible to see how their carryover is at different points of the day, to have ongoing collaboration with the general <laughs> education teacher, um, as well as to provide um, more general education supports to all the students because really everyone can benefit from PT or OT or speech. There, there are, are tools that we can give all students to help them better learn and better engage with the life of the school. Uh, so we are better able to support that. We're also able to create some of those visuals or those social stories or other tools that students need to help better connect with their learning. Um, so really this model, you know, it promotes this interdisciplinary collaboration in the moment. It doesn't tie us to the schedule outside of, you know, those three direct service periods. So we're able to see a lot more progress. 
we started talking about this model last year and the elementary and middle schools um, and preschool as well started transitioning to this model last year about this time um, end of March beginning of April the high school started transitioning to that model in September. So this year has really been a transition year for us. As we've been holding IEP meetings, we've been you know, thinking about our caseloads and which students um, on our caseload would benefit from a model like this. Because there are certain students who won't. You know, this is all individualized. That's why it's an individualized education program. So you know, we consider those factors. And for those students who would benefit from this type of a model, we've been making the changes at the IEP. So now that we're coming up at a one year interval, most of our students have transitioned to this model. So we're really able to start implementing it the way it was intended um, in terms of being able to do those indirect activities. So we wanted to give you um, a sense of across each of our disciplines, you know, what that indirect week might be. Because, you know, we all joked around about how it's right. not a week off. <laughs> this is still very much a week on. But like, what does that look like? Um, so in terms of um, speech, you know, there's a really critical training component, I think with all of our disciplines. Um, and in terms of speech, especially when I have students that are using visual tools or if they are using communication devices, I need to be able to make sure that the staff that are working with those students more frequently than I am are, have a good understanding of how to model language, of how to model the um, expectations in terms of their social communication, of how to model um, vocabulary strategies. So able to provide that training, again, in the moment um, when it's going to be most applicable to that student. We're able to um, have observations of students in their authentic interactions and not just their interactions with me um, and you know a couple of other kids in the therapy room. I'm able to see, well, if we're working on small talk, for example, like, you know, what does that look like when they're entering the school um, in the morning and they're hanging up their backpacks? You know, if a friend asks a question, are they able to have that basic conversation or do they get stuck? You know, how are they accessing those strategies that we're working on? Um, we're also able to provide more general education supports. Um, every classroom has so much wonderful content. Um, and the other positive is that every classroom has a teacher who is very open to enriching that content with more language and making it more accessible for kids who might have trouble with learning language and, and acquiring um, you know, new, uh, new expressive language and receptive language skills. So I can go into the classroom and I can, you know, join in and co-teach with the teacher about, you know, the topic that they're doing and create like semantic networks and webs for them so they're able to see the vocabulary come to life. I've also done, and this is something again that you know a general education teacher could do, but sometimes having somebody else come in to do it. The kids pay, t pay attention a little bit differently. So at the beginning of the year, I had um, several teachers requesting me to come in uh, during the indirect cycle and do whole class volume lessons on voice volume. And we would practice, you know, what are the different volumes that we need to use for different situations and go through all of that. Um, I've done, with the younger grades, um, especially kindergarten and first grade, I've done whole class articulation lessons. A lot of kids in K and 1 have trouble with their R's or with their L's or their THs. So we've done a lot of modeling with that. Um, the other um, piece that's really nice about some of these lessons is when we go into the classroom and do something on a whole class basis, the students who um, come out of the classroom with me, they are kind of already the experts because they've already heard some of this. So they're, they get the opportunity to model it for their peers as well, which is a nice moment for them to shine. Um, in the middle school, the fifth and sixth graders um, have been benefiting from the middle school SLP going in and providing some social emotional support lessons. Um, and that helps the children on their IEPs reinforce skills. But as we all know, with the way the past two years have been with the pandemic, everyone can benefit from that kind of a lesson. So that's been great. At the high school level, um, the SLP there has been able to go out into the community and do um, generalization of the skills she's working on at their job sites or you know, at, on their community trips or wherever that may be. Um, so Abby, you, I know you're going to share a bit about the OT piece. Yeah, so as far as OT, again, having that week allows the flexibility in our schedules. So a lot of times when we're trying to make our schedules, we're looking at the opportune times 
within the classroom when we're going in that work on the goals that we have. However, sometimes we find when we're in there in the moment, they're like, oh, that's right, I have to pay attention, I have to do. So it's nice to be able to go in at other opportunities to make sure that those skills are carrying over. Um, sometimes we're really looking at that handwriting piece. Are they carrying it over into math? Are they carrying that over when they're writing their letters or um, are they carrying that over even into social studies and science when they're having to do more of those writing tasks as they get older? Um, another big component that we look at is just that self-regulation piece. Are they ready to learn? Are they ready to learn in the morning versus the afternoon? How are they in the lunchroom? That's a very unstructured, different environment. So it gives us that flexibility to really go in and observe um, during all those different standpoints um, instead of just that one set time that's in our schedule when we're normally in. Um, it gives us a variety of opportunities, even going out to recess and checking in to see how they're doing playing versus lining up versus, versus getting ready to come back in or the organizational pieces. Can they organize cleaning up their snack? Can they organize putting away their papers? Um, so it just gives us a lot of variety of times that we can go in to check on the classrooms and even go check in on specials, whether it be art, whether it be wellness, um, and all those different areas to make sure that those skills are carrying over. Um, another piece too is it provides that opportunity to join in in center times. At the elementary level, um, the teachers do a lot of what they call daily five or the math workshops. And so sometimes it allows us to be a part or an adult at a center and help run the center. So not only are we checking in on our students on our caseload, but we're also checking in, especially at the younger grades, on those students that the teachers might have some concerns on and say, hey, can you just check in and let me know whether we need to start putting in some more plans or you think we're okay for right now. So it gives us that flexibility to have that observation time, not only for our caseload, but other kiddos coming through. Okay, I'm Lisa McDonnell. I'm the physical therapist in the system. Um, I have a unique role in the sense that I'm the only PT in the district. So as you can imagine, my schedule is very tight as I go school to school during the day and has not up to this point allowed me much opportunity to check a kid out on the playground unless it's that two minutes as I'm walking from my car into the building or to shadow somebody in wellness class to see if the skills that we've been working on are indeed being carried over into the wellness class. Um, so that's been huge. Um, you know, when you go out to the playground and you watch kids interacting with their peers, they may do a skill for you in a private PT session that they're unwilling to do when there's a whole bunch of kids around. And then we realize we have to practice, and we have to practice it more on the playground with other peers around, that sort of thing. Um, same thing with wellness. You know, the ball skills and some of the other skills we may have practiced, are they incorporating them into the wellness class? It also allows an in-the-moment consult with the wellness teacher. Okay, he's really afraid of the ball. Maybe if we can get him a softer ball, then he'll be more um, receptive to playing catch with his peer, that sort of thing. Um, another thing that I look at as a PT is somebody's sitting posture in class. A lot of our kids have core weakness. So we want to know, are they able to sit erect in the class? Do they need a tool? So like for some of our little ones, do they need to sit in a cube chair so that they can sit erect so that they're not all flopped in their seat? Um, for some of the older kids, can they sit erect? or Do they have sensory issues? Do we need to give them a move and sit cushion so that they can seek out that sensory input? Do they, some of our kids sit on wobble schools, some of our kids sit on balls where they're working to help build their core at the same time as they're trying to help pay attention. So it basically, in my role, I mean, the big areas that I really look at are the in-class participation, and then those for our babies, our little preschoolers, you go in and watch them do a music lesson. Can they follow along? Can they sequence the events? Can they motor plan what the teacher's doing? Um, and it gives us just sort of some insight into, so often we say that our role is to help somebody fully participate with their peers at recess and in wellness, and if we never get to see those environments, um, it's really difficult to make that call. So it's really been, um, it's been key, and at least in my role, it's been key to see it in the moment. Thank you. So I think, you know, it's been a difficult and um, wild past couple of years, but through that all, I think it's opened up our eyes and we've, you know, had to look at things a little bit differently and, you know, make some adjustments. And there has been a lot of silver lining through all of that. And um, I think the piece to all of our disciplines as well is that it, there's this constant evolution and this need to constantly you know be aware of what the current best practices are so we'll continue to evolve but i feel confident that we've made some nice nice steps over the past couple of years to really 
increase our ability to provide students with the access to the curriculum, the access to the life of the school to make their experience as enriching as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to start? Wow. <laughs> wow. You just got 25 minutes. You got, you got service delivery in 25 minutes. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> that was awesome. Can I ask? It just, this is more overarching, just so I can get a sense of it, because I really, I really, really appreciate the examples. It's awesome. It's kind of what I came for. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm curious about like overall caseloads and numbers. You mentioned a little bit you're at IGO, and then you have six others at Burl, and yes. So and at IGO, I've got um, okay. there's another SLP who comes. Um, two and a half days per cycle. Um, the SLP who's at Taylor comes in. So I go is, it's a big building, it's a busy it building. Sure. Um, you know, in terms of the numbers of students that we have on speech at IGO, I would have to double check because it's constantly changing in terms of, of evaluations, but it, it usually is somewhere between 40 and 50. Okay. Um, and then yeah, I have the um, six, six DLC kids um, <clears throat> over at uh, Burl as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. So I am all over. <laughs> um, currently, well, we just hired a new long-term sub for OT, so they are covering um, the Taylor School and part of the Ahern. Um, I cover preschool, the borough school, the DLC program with Pam, and some students up at the Ahern as well. Um, so my caseload, again, fluctuates because preschool kids are coming and going. Um, yeah. As soon as it doesn't matter when they turn three, but they turn three and they come in. <laughs> So it's always throughout the year. Um, sure. Okay. But I think right now, upwards about 55. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And I think my PT, PT caseload right now is in the low 40s. Kids are coming and going, but right. yeah, we're yeah, busy. There's a lot of in and yeah, a lot of flux. We service some students um, and part of general, general education as well uh, through individual curriculum accommodation plans. Um, that's part of our MTSS process, the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, so these are students who the teachers may request a screen for, and it's part of our tier two interventions for them. Sure. Um, some of these students do go on for evaluations. Some of them, um, you know, our, our goal with all of them is to intervene as early as possible so that we give them the skills at a young enough age, they're able to acquire them, and they're not they're not going to have an impact to their ability to access the curriculum. So that's what our goal is. So there are, um, we all have students on ICAPS as well. Thank you. Do you want to keep going? <laughs> biggest, uh, how about, uh, biggest pleasant surprise in terms of going into the classroom? Oh, I love when I do the whole class lessons with the teacher. I, like, I, Never wanted to be a classroom teacher because managing that number of students sounds, I like my little small groups. But I, um, you know, being able to do the co-teaching has been awesome and I, I love, um, you know, the relationship. I, I've, I have a wonderful relationship with my colleagues, but when I'm going in and co-teaching, we're building off that relationship in different ways. We're bouncing off of one another. Um, and it just seems super engaging for the kids. And I really enjoy being able to work with students in that way and to work with varying levels of students, to have some models and to have some students benefiting from that. I, I've loved that. I think as crazy it is, as it is being across so many different levels, um, it's been really amazing to see some of the students that I knew back when they were in preschool oh, walking well through the halls at sure. the Ahern, towering over me, and just how successful they have become and what a transition they have made. Um, so it's nice to be able to go in the classroom and just see them being, not even kind of recognizing them almost, because they're not sticking out. They're not, they're just part of the core group. Um, so that's, I think, one of the best things to be able to go in and see. Okay. I would have to agree with that, it's, especially as the PT over the years, is to watch the kids mm -hmm. grow and develop. Um, and it's also, like, just recently when I went into a wellness class, there's a, a young student that I work on, and when we practice ball skills, <sighs> he does it quick, high, and ineffective. But boy, in gym class, when he has a yarn ball and he's <laughs> aiming for the kid across the gym, he has a whole different spin on it, which is nice to see, and that's what counts. Great. So it's like, okay, on. we don't need to focus on that so much anymore. He's got that. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah. Thank you all for everything that you do. The presentation was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, so I did want to add something. So uh, I, I first wanted to thank you right out of the gate. You, you, you talked about resources and opportunity, I think. That's the way I took it in, my, in the way I heard it. Um, and I, I really appreciate that because uh, I think it's easy to throw things on the wall and put them on the table. But to bring them off the table and into the hands and into the to to actual use is a whole nother game. So uh, I I want to thank you and all the staff for doing that because that's what I think I heard you say that we got the resources. There's been a little bit of an influx here over a period of time, whether it's 12 to 24 months, whatever it is. But it, we got to do something with what's in front of us, right? So I think that's critical. Uh, and you've done professional development to do that. So I hope that the people watching take that away, that the staff took a recognition of what the resources that were brought to bear but how to use them most effectively and use the time wisely. And that was done, and that was done in professional development in the summer or mm -hmm. you know, on your backs, of course, which is, which is very appreciated, too. The, the other thing I, I just took from it is, uh, again, the words were flying quickly, to be completely honest. But, I'm uh, a fast talker. Well, that's okay. That's okay. That's good. Yeah. There's a lot of context. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of context there, too. There but, but I think there's some big ones. I, think tra I heard transitioning, mm -hmm. right? which is, I think is critical, and that's bringing the resources at the right time. I heard interdisciplinary many times, mm -hmm. um, and obviously that three to one is obviously hinging on that piece, right? So I, I hope it's understood by people that pay attention to what's happening or have heard it, that that's what's really happening. There's some big steps and big things that are here, and that three to one is absolutely critical to it because it's putting it in place and then seeing it in action and supporting with the, the full staff. So um, that, that's kind of what I took from this is really the, the depth of what you're offering. Uh, and I guess the step back and the step forward with understanding what it was and putting it there. Um, and finally, I would just say your, your enthusiasm, your energy, um, I think that's what you all do. But um, I hope people take away that uh, putting that time in and, and, and seeing the big picture and seeing where we have to begin and get to uh, is, is not, it's not always si simple to put that out in front of you all the time mm -hmm. so that you can see the kid from kindergarten to middle school, right? Mm -hmm. And so to keep that in front of you all the time as a vision is really important. So that's, that's what I heard your presentation as. I hope I encapsulated it well, but I think you nailed it saying it. So I hope people hear it and what goes into that. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take, if you guys don't mind, I know Joe's been patiently waiting to yes. ask a question or make Absolutely. a comment. Not a question. Absolutely. It's, it's a comment related okay. to the discussion. Uh, Here we go. <laughs> Joe knows. <laughs> I'm Joe Garrity. I'm a former student of Foxborough. And one takeaway I got from tonight's presentation was the three to one model. I never heard of that before. Yeah. And then another thing I wanted to point out to you these ser related services that um, you guys are talking about tonight. Over my years of schooling in Foxborough, I have developed many strong skills and learned a lot of these services to make growth and development and um, have a successful life and successful future from all these services provided. Great. Thank you, Jim. I acquired many skills from them. Thank, Thank you, you Joe. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. It's, a great, it's a great testimony. Thank you. You're very well. Thank um, you. And I just, uh, so there's a reason why this is, this piece of our agenda is always one of our favorites, or at least um, in, the, in the few years that I've been on the committee. And it's always one of our favorites because it's really fun to hear. It's fun to watch. Um, I went on a journey with you. I think I started out with where I think where you were a lot of stuff you said, which was there was a situation we saw an opportunity and we found ways to close a gap, right? And that was that's phenomenal in and of itself. That's innovation. That's what we want, right? And then I went on this whole thing around all the really cool stuff that's actually happening when you're working with the students, which is really why you guys, I think, do what you do and why we love watching you do what you do and hearing about what you do, because that's why we're all here, right? So I'm just. I, I think I said a, a couple of times ago where I thought the, edu the technology education specialist may have had the coolest jobs in the whole district, but I got to think that you guys might, might be, <laughs> if not slightly ahead, you're right up there with them because you, you do some really cool stuff and you clearly, clearly love what you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, let's just pause there for a moment because that was fun. Right? Yeah, it was good. That's great. And uh, now we're going to go over to next on our agenda is the superintendent's update, Dr. Burdos. 
So with each of these updates, it's continued to get better and better as we look at our numbers significantly decline, which is so wonderful. And that is two years from if we think back. And we had heard that it was going to take about two years, and certainly we are in a very different place. So just as some of the updates, at the last uh, meeting, our positivity rate in Foxborough, we knew that it had moved down to substantial from high risk and that we had about a 16% positivity rate. We're down to a 1.8% in Foxborough where there's only 12 cases, mm -hmm. but we only have three in the schools as of our last posting and that will be updated again tomorrow. So significantly different than what we have been seeing throughout. Our vaccination rates, we've continued to see about a two to 4% increase from my last update on those. So at the high school right now, we're at 81%. At the Ahern, we're at 71%. At the Borough, we are at 47%. And I had a parent email me after the last update with an excellent question. And because preschool cannot be um, received the vaccine, well, what would that percent look like yeah. for the Borough mm -hmm. if we excluded preschool for that purpose, which right. I thought was a really great question, so I wanted to just add. So at the borough without preschool, we're at 62%, which is right in line with our other elementary schools, meaning the IGOs at 63% and the Taylors at 63% as well. So I, I thank that parent for, for that question. That was, I think, a really helpful um, data point to look at. So obviously we are now at a point in um, this time period where masks have gone away. And we still see probably five to 10% across the district of students wearing masks for a variety of reasons. Um, but you, you do see a new energy in the schools um, with that. So we're, we're just so thankful that from a health perspective, we're in a very different place. The other um, part of moving forward is starting next week. We've had um, not had the volunteers in schools because of all this. We're going to start moving back with the support of our local health officials to having our volunteers back in our schools. I mean, that's more so at the elementary level. We've got our elementary principals here too, and they'll be communicating that to families. But at the middle school as well, we have some parent volunteers. So seeing them come back into the schools is going to show just that next step of getting towards normalcy, which is really exciting. So those are kind of the COVID updates. I'll stop there in case there's any questions before I go on to a couple of other updates. Are there um, are there other steps um, before you all before you consider it feeling even more normal? I guess more pre-COVID. Well, we're, we're still we still have positive cases. Like I said, we know at our last we had three. So the contact tracing, the the test and stay, that's all still In taking place. place. Sure. Um, the hand washing, all of the cleaning, all of those things. But some of that we've learned even just because we know flu is going around mm -hmm. good as idea. well. So those are all really good practices to safeguard with yep. those mitigation strategies. But we're seeing the normalcy as far as, um, obviously, the masks not being there is, right. is a very visible one. But the other part that's really visible is looking at the data. Mm -hmm. Anything else? OK, so as far as other updates, um, one, we'll get to it in our next agenda item, um, but I would just like to update on our Foxborough High School principal search. We have our site visit this Thursday with finalist Jim Donovan, and he will be visiting all day at the high school, and a meet and greet for parents in the community will take place in the first floor media center from 2.45 to 3.15. So folks are invited to come in to meet him at that time, and again, he'll be spending the full day there and meeting with other um, faculty and staff and students and, and observing classrooms, et cetera. And then, the um, assistant superintendent search, that is well underway, and we've started with interviews this week with last night and then continuing. We've got Sarah and Brent on that committee, so lots going on and lots of evenings out for, for uh, sure all of us and, and you as well, so thank you for that. And then... Um, it's good company. We've got, we've okay. great, we've got great um, committees, and, you know, just... <clears throat> I, I know I've sent out emails to really publicly... Um, 
notice who's on those committees because we do have parents we do have mm -hmm, teachers right. we do have administrators and it is a huge commitment but one of the things that i've heard as i walk each of the candidates out afterwards they're so impressed with the committee and all the stakeholders sitting at the table and the commitment to our process that we have and they really feel the um difference in walking in and hearing from the stakeholders that are there at the table and really seeing the thoroughness of our process. We'll talk a little bit more in our next agenda item about that, but just an update there of where we are with those. The other, um, it's not so much of an update, is I just wanted to recognize that um, Mrs. Myers Pakla, she was recognized for a Distinguished Service Award with the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, and uh, not school committees, with um, with uh, student council, it's MASC, that's where we're getting it's yeah. the same yeah. um, uh, acronym there. But just, she has really devoted so many years to student council and she was recognized recently at their state um, conference at the beginning mm -hmm. of March, so I wanted to notice that as well. And then other updates, just a lot going on. As spring is in the air, we've got kindergarten conferences that have been taking place this week and Bandorama and spring sports and so many other other things to um, right. look forward to. And then the last one I'll just mention is next week, we um, sent out for Mr. Michael Lasik actually, is on Tuesday the 29th from six to seven, there will be a partnership that we have with the Department of Mental Health and that's um, a collaboration with them and how can the, how can the Department of Public Health help families? What are resources that are there? We know that we are still in the throes of everything with the pandemic and continuing all the things we're doing in schools, but the other pieces that we're trying to do with outreach through um, different workshops for parents. And that's another one that's coming up on how can the Department of Mental Health help families and the resources that are there. So that's Tuesday the 29th from 6 to 7. And really appreciative of Mr. Michael and continuing to bring these different opportunities for outreach to families. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Can I just dovetail? I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned Diana's award for the, the student council. Um, I, I don't know if people even know that, but know this, but she was the student council advisor at Foxborough High School in the 90s uh, before she left, before she left. So she was working with students back in the 90s, and then I was fortunate to work with her side by side when I was a principal on the student council committee for the M, uh, MSAA, which is who helped give the award. And uh, it, it really, she, she received that award uh, not only because of what she does here in Foxborough and all these other things, but her years of service to students across the state of Massachusetts, it really was tremendous. She went to national conferences with those kids in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Um, and so, so that, that Distinguished Service Award was really for some very, very profound years of work. Uh, I, I wouldn't even want to add the number up, but I, it's got to be 30 plus consecutive years of working with student councils across the state of Massachusetts That's and in cool. our kids. And it made a difference in our school in Foxborough. Mm -hmm. As an advisor in the 90s, even though she left for a few years and came back, uh, developing student leadership in schools is critical to the success. So it, it really was a great award and, and it could go unnoticed with if, if it wasn't recognized that the longevity and the depth of the, the commitment. So I just happen to know a lot about it. So I, I think it was well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bertos. We can stay with you if you'd like, or we can switch to Dr. Mello, uh, who's, again, who's taking the lead on this one. I'll, I'll start off, and I think we'll probably tag team a little bit here, but I'd like to invite Mr. Robert Worth up to the guest table here for an introduction. Also would like to recognize that we have the Ahern principal, Ms. Frazier, in the um, audience, Ms. Campbell from the IGO principal, Mr. Stanton over there from the Taylor, and then obviously Mr. Michael Azik's here as well to support his introduction as he welcome, is welcome to our administrative team, and we had some others that were not able to be here this evening. But just as a reminder, and kind of going back to the thorough process that we have, with Mrs. McCarthy retiring, we posted that position at the end of December, December 29th, mm -hmm. actually. And then 
a lot happens between then and now. We, in the month of January, we had many focus groups with parents, with faculty and staff. What were they looking for in the next principal for the borough to follow um, the excellent leadership that Ms. McCarthy provided for the 17 years at Borough and 20 years total to Foxborough. Right. So big shoes to fill, not to scare you <laughs> there. But then after that, the screening committee, again, a, a large group of stakeholders to screen all of the applicants, to go through to identify interviews, multiple interviews, and then it ended with site visits with a couple of different finalists and all of the feedback then coming at the end of that. So in addition to that time period from December up until the point of where we are here this evening, just wanted to take a, a couple of moments to mention some things about Mr. Worth from references that he had as well as the site visit. I had the um, wonderful opportunity of spending the whole day at Burrell with him and meeting with parents in the morning and in classrooms and with faculty and staff and um, he even was able to Zoom with Ms. McCarthy as part of that <laughs> visit as well. But I think that some of the things that stood out to me from the things that people said about him through his references, people I spoke with, that Dr. Mello spoke with, is just some of the words, a natural leader, strong and effective communicator, an exceptional rapport with students and staff and families, a true partner and respected by all, compassionate, highly visible, collaborative and approachable, very thoughtful in his approach and an active listener. His unwavering commitment to serve all students as well as staff and families. A great sense of humor, um, an amazing problem solver. And then one of the comments that really stood out in the ending of, and this was a letter of recommendation and then also followed up in a conversation with his superintendent. And he just said, an outstanding educational leader. So high praise coming from all of the administrators that he has worked with. His background, you have the resume in your packet and you can see from his educational experience, it's varied, he brings, an, um, from teaching experience to his last four years as the assistant and current assistant principal, um, serving two different schools in Rentham right now. So he's very busy with, I think, close to 800 or so kids that are there. Um, but uh, do you want to follow up a little bit before we, we give him a chance to tell a little bit more about sure, himself? Sure, sure. Nice to see you. Welcome back. Uh, as Dr. Bertos mentioned, we did have a really large committee that you walked into, you know, made up of parents and school committee and different stakeholders across the district, administrators, teachers from all different um, aspects of the school community. And what I took away was the overwhelming sense of you matching the attributes of what they were looking for in their next leader. Everything that Dr. Berto said and more. I think having that, um, that comfort with people and being able to speak to the issues and the challenges that we face right now in the educational landscape and what you would bring to contribute to our community. We always look when we are hiring for someone who can add value to what we already have in our skill set, and we see that in you. And I know that uh, I was not able to be at the site visit, but I heard all wonderful things from all the people who didn't get to meet you. And I heard that you may have brought cookies, which is always a good idea too, but um, it was a wonderful experience for teachers to see you interact with students and your comfort in the classroom. And it just feels like it's going to be a very natural transition, which I'm not sure people could have imagined when no. Mrs. McCarthy was here, because we, as Dr. Berto said, it's a, you know, it's a shift in big shoes to fill after so long. So um, we're excited that we're at this point. It was a long, it's a long process. And you may not have been in the site visit, but you did all the work with the committee and leading that, so thank you. <laughs> well, yes, and thanks to those who served uh, on that with me. Um, I know Sarah was there. Um, it was a great experience. I always enjoy those. I, I'm glad we don't have to do them too often, but um, it was a great experience. And we just felt very fortunate that we had such a qualified candidate in the mix. So welcome. So Robert, we'll turn it over to you at this point. If you, you know, some of the things that maybe are not in your resume or packet to give a little bit more about yourself and why you were interested in joining us in Foxborough. And then obviously they probably have questions for you as well. Thank you, Dr. Bertos, and thank you, Dr. Mello, and thank you, members of the school committee. Um, I, I'm absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm in awe. I, I mean, those are extremely um, flattering things uh, to say about me. Um, I 
you know, I'm thrilled to be selected as the, uh, as the new principal of the Burroughs School. Um, I'm excited and honored to be here. Um, I, I couldn't have imagined, um, you know, a, a more exciting thing to happen to me. Um, my family's also very excited. Um, my wife and uh, my two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old and one-year-old. Uh, <laughs> the one-year-old, uh, I think she's excited, but I can't tell. Uh, the two-and-a-half-year-old is definitely very excited. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's been an amazing experience um, overall. And uh, visiting the Burrell School, spending the day there with Dr. Burdos and the staff, um, meeting with families, uh, going into classrooms. Um, Dr. Burdos saw the importance of prioritizing um, that time in classrooms during that site visit. I got to spend so much valuable time in classrooms and um, that, was, that was the key for me. That was when I got to see the impressive work that um, is being done at the Burrell every day. Um, committed teachers who care about their students, engaged in the process of teaching and learning, um, students who were curious and confident, um, caring for one another. Uh, I was just extremely impressed. Um, at the same time, it felt like a very familiar place. Um, it felt very familiar on a smaller scale from where I currently work, um, which is great because I, I truly, honestly love my current job. Um, and um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have gone anywhere. I wouldn't have made a, a transition to a principal position um, had I not felt that um, similarity and that uh, famil familiar feeling uh, that I felt at the Burroughs School. Um, I, I feel truly honored to, to be the next principal there. Um, and I'm very excited to begin my work. Um, I, I'm also excited that I get the time to kind of say goodbye to everybody in my current district. Uh, when I shared the news with my staff that uh, you know, I would be kind of making this, this transition to this opportunity and that I'd be interviewing, uh, this, the staff in Rentham um, was extremely supportive. Uh, they, um, you know, they, were, they were vocally supportive, um, and I truly felt like they were supportive in the way that a family is supportive um, of, of that. Um, and uh, you know, at that point, I, I was confident that uh, you know, this opportunity would present itself. Um, but uh, if it didn't, uh, I was also very happy uh, where I currently am. Uh, and I remark on that because it's important to know that someone who's coming to you uh, is coming from a very happy place and, and a, a content place. Um, and I am. And, uh, you know, I am also very excited, like I said, to, to be entering Foxborough. Uh, it's a place that feels familiar right away. It's a place that um, I look forward to spending, um, you know, a good portion of the next portion of my career in. Um, and I'm, I, could not be more thrilled. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I was just going to say, he said he's happy where he's at. So ask any other assistant principal in this room <laughs> if they would want to have two schools and the bus coordinator. Is there any principal here that would like to have two different schools and the bus coordinator? And he says he's happy. So what, what great experience you had there, too. Oh, my gosh. So uh, we're, I'm glad to have you here, too. And it looks like from your resume, you got a bunch of uh, Things that in, in your in your in your bag already to help to help strengthen you as you, as you go forward. So uh, you hopefully we won't have to do many buses here. That's that'll be like a vacation, right? I think. <laughs> that is exciting to me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there was no question in there. Just uh, well, I just I was just he was saying you're so happy. I was pleased that he's happy where he's at, which I think is a great point to make yes. that you're Thank coming you. from one to another. Absolutely. But, but I was like, wow, he's happy doing that. Absolutely, <laughs> Brent. Sure. Um, so. My question, I don't need a ton of detail, I, but because one of the things that the, the entire admin team, principals and everybody, has been talking about as we come out of the pandemic is, uh, and we stop, no, that's, we never really stop paddling, but we stop feel like, feeling like you're drowning a little bit, is you know, how do we move forward? And it's a question I get from a lot of parents, and I'm just wondering kind of your thoughts from where you're coming to the little bit you've seen coming forward and, and as you enter the enter Foxborough, how do you see you know your role in ensuring that we can get a firm handle on both the academic progression of our students and their emotional development and health um, in your building after these last two years of some disruption? Um, and, and maybe what does that what does that look like to you? Thank you for that question. Um, sure. It's it's an excellent question. It's a, it's a, obviously a big question, and um, I. Yeah. 
I don't feel like I can fully answer it um, from the from the borough perspective, so I'm going to answer it a little bit from my current perspective. But that's fact, um, that's actually what I'm interested in. So thank you. Yeah, like I said, I think uh, you know I think there's a lot of similarities between the two schools. Sure. Um, you know, one of the one of the main similarities as we think about student mental health support is um, in the implementation of a responsive classroom curriculum as our secondary SEL curriculum uh, for the district. Um, we've been doing that in Rentham for. Um, just a little bit longer than it's been done at the elementary level in Foxborough. So we're right around the same time. Um, we're kind of in that refresher stage um, that I think uh, the elementary schools in Foxborough are at. Um, okay. That is one of the things that we were actually doing before the pandemic, um, just like you did. It seems like you kind of got a head start on that. But it's one of many things that we did um, not obviously in anticipation of a pandemic, but just in anticipation of meeting what's next for the needs of our students. We were very fortunate to be um, you know, making a transition from response to intervention to an MTSS model. I know that you were um, kind of along the same path. Um, it's things like that that we were already doing to support our students, to support the staff at the school, to support families and communicate that with families. Um, those type of things, using universal screeners um, and assessment data to inform our decisions every day, um, both academically and social emotional universal screeners, um, are things that we started to do before the pandemic. We were very fortunate to do those things, offer refreshers throughout the pandemic, offer additional professional development for, um, stu for staff um, and, uh, as well as uh, families. And those things that were already in motion I think they really helped us to sustain the momentum throughout the pandemic, find additional ways to support the students and, and staff at our school um, and the families um, through, um, you know, digestive, easily digestible communication, um, which, uh, which, which is challenging. Uh, it's, you know, it's always it is. trying to find a way to let families know exactly what's going on uh, without overwhelming them. Those are things that were already happening in the district. Uh, and I think, I think it's similar at the borough. I think it's similar throughout Foxborough. Uh, and I could feel that when I came um, in for my initial interview and throughout the interview process. Um, those are the things that I think are going to be able to sustain the momentum as we emerge from uh, some of the confines that the, the pandemic has placed um, in, on education. Um, but hands down, the most important thing is knowing students well. Getting to know our students well and knowing them as learners as they progress, especially in an elementary school, especially in an elementary school that has um, an integrated preschool, is absolutely essential. Um, and that is something that I could also feel throughout the interview process. I could feel that the Burroughs um, school staff were committed to knowing students well in all of their many dimensions um, as um, you know, right. learners in the classroom, but also as um, you know, uh, student, as um, children and just kind of getting to know them and uh, getting to know who they are, how they learn, what they need. Um, and that's something that I am also truly committed to. Um, I talked a little bit in, throughout the interview process of uh, prioritizing my time in a school through connecting with the school staff, mm -hmm. making sure that I was there, I was present, I was in classrooms, I was at every um, arrival, every dismissal, every lunch, every recess, um, as many as I could be, um, and really making sure that I'm able to connect with students and families and get to know students well. Um, I found those relationships with students in the school to be truly the most valuable component um, for myself and for all the staff throughout the pandemic and as we emerge from it. Thank you. I, I love that you answered my next two questions as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fold it right in there. No, thank you very much. And I'll yeah. echo what um, Mr. Peterson said, that it's lovely to be in a position where you can leave a place that you feel like you have a family and also feel like you're coming to a place where you can create a new one. So thank you so much for uh, trusting us with your next steps. And I believe we're very, very lucky to have you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Hello again. Hi. I'm very glad to see you. It was great to get to sit in on the interview process, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, thank you for everything that you've said, and can't wait to work together going forward. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, Brent covered all my questions. I guess I used to go first. That's what it was. So uh, it is a pleasure to meet you. Um, I heard really great things. Um, from your site visit. I heard um, from the interview process um, 
how impressed people were and how excited they were about the possibility of you coming to Foxborough. So, um, like Brent said, we are thrilled um, that you want to go on this journey with us. We I, the, the um, we're very proud. I think you probably have heard that repeatedly um, of our school system and our uh, our administration, our building staff, um, our community in, in general, um, and. Uh, it's very important to us that the people that come and work with us here um, are also excited to be here and want to help it make it make it even better. So, um, I appreciate the thoroughness of your responses. I appreciate the thoughtfulness of your speaking voice. Um, it's very clear um, from just your presence that you are a dedicated um, educator. That you are. Um, thoughtful in your presentation, that you listen really actively. Um, and I think that those are all things that if I had been a part of the committee um, this time, uh, I would have been looking for in the next leader for the borough. So thank you so much for coming tonight and, and letting us get to know you a little bit better. Um, we look forward to um, welcoming you with even more open arms uh, summertime. Is that when with this is? OK. So. Yes. And July 1 is the official start date, but there will be, at, towards the end of the school year, an opportunity for families to be able to come out and more of another meet and greet. Excellent, excellent. So we look forward to seeing you then, and make, maybe meet your family too, uh, so they because it's a it's a it's a really great Fox is a really great town, uh, and I before we finish this up, um, I do want to thank Dr. Mello. Um, I had the pr pleasure um, a couple years ago with Mer Mr. 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 Michael Lazik. I got it right that time. I practiced in my head repeatedly before I said it out loud um, to be a part of the process. And I know how much I learned from that. Um, I know that you know that's why Brent wanted to do it again. I know Richard's participated before. I know Sarah. I'm, I, I'm imagining that you really enjoyed being a part of that process. And that's why you, you, you signed up again right on the heels of that one. So thank you. And thank you to all of the people who, commu who, who uh, participated in that process. It is time consuming. It is very important work. Um, and we do appreciate you know everything that goes into it. We appreciate you putting yourself in the arena, um, uh, and are really really excited to have you. So thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, I echo all that. It's the the process was unbelievable. It was very very impressive. Um, I enjoyed it, which um, it, oh. you know it's when you go into a room of 15 people, it uh, can be a little overwhelming, um, but it's truly enjoyable. I mean, it, it reflected very well on the values um, and the investment of uh, the members of the community from um, teachers and staff to uh, family members, school committee members. So um, thank you to everyone on that committee. Thank you. I would say, Mr. Canfield, if I can say one more thing, we, we did have a long standing school committee member who always said, thank you for choosing Foxborough. So in, in the words of Bevy, I will say thank you for choosing Foxborough. Exactly. Because we're happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you. So oh, yes. Oh, thank you very much. Go Thanks ahead. to the rest of the team for being here to support yes. the, thank the you. new member of the team. Yes. And don't pick on him because the new guy gets a new building. But I mean, someone had to get okay. someone had to get wow. Pearl, So yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're next. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And speaking of that, wow, this is like we rehearsed or something. We didn't. By the way, we didn't. Just like, that's probably against some open meeting law if I said that. Uh, so next on the agenda is our vote on the Mass School Building Authority Statement of Interest for the uh, uh, improvements to the Taylor Elementary School. Dr. Burdos. So if we think back to early in the fall, the actually it was the September 21st school committee meeting. At that time, uh, Mr. Yukina had talked about the conversation with Bill Keegan and that we needed to go forward with the statement of interest with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. We know that it is um, a very long process. It took three times before it was accepted for the borough school, the statement of interest. And so being able to start that process now is why that is so important, because we know that from start to finish, it's going to be years. And with that being said, we need the approval of the school committee as well as the board of selectmen in a public meeting 
that acknowledges that as the superintendent that we would be applying towards that statement of interest with the MSBA. So this evening, what we need from you as a school committee, you, you already had unanimously back in September had said, yes, please go forward and submit the statement of interest, but we need to have that public vote along with the language that needs to be um, embedded within that statement of interest. Thank you. So we do have that language. Is there, Richard, did you want to make that motion yeah. and, and read that for us, please? Thank you, Richard. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee of the town of Foxboro, in accordance with its charter bylaws and ordinances, vote to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form to be submitted by April 29th for the Taylor Elementary School located at 196 South Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems, such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy-related cost in a school facility. Additionally, replacement of or addition to obsolete building in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements. Thank you. Second? I'd Thank like you. to second. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, all in favor of the submission? Aye. 400. Zero, zero. Thank you. Um, if you guys can just indulge me one second. I forgot, Mr. Worth. I, 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 you can stay where you are. Grace and Jacob, I didn't give a chance. I, didn't get, I forgot to give you guys a chance to ask any questions of Mr. Worth if you had anything um, that you wanted to, to say or. Um, Welcome him, whatever. I apologize for that. I, I did not mean to exclude you. Um, I, I need a mic. Oh, sure. Come on over. Um, I don't really have any questions specifically, but I did go to the borough, so I know that you have really big shoes to fill. <laughs> so That's going to get old. <laughs> yeah. And, oh yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you. If, please. Please, sure. Jacob. Thank you. You can go. <laughs> it's also a good sign that we keep saying people have big shoes to fill, That's by right. the way. Yes. Because we do. They do. Uh, I also went to the borough and... <laughs> <laughs> and with these, this was not a plant, by the way. We didn't, I, didn't, I actually didn't know what elementary school they went to. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Um, I, there's not a lot to say, but thanks for being here and uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys very much. And uh, again, thank you for indulging me. I did, I did not mean to exclude you earlier. I apologize. It was a point of pride when Mrs. McCarthy was here last time that she pointed out that there were two Borough School alums, remember? Yes. She did. Um, yes. I, I, you know. Yes, she did. My kids all went there. So I, you know, <laughs> I'll just be some, look. And both Brett, my, you went there? No, both of my. Okay, I'm going to say, up. that's like, so, okay. I went to that building is not a school. Okay. <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you. So next uh, on the agenda, school committee vote on school choice. So this is a required annual vote that needs to take place based on policy JFBB. Mm -hmm. And um, in the past, we have voted, or you have voted, to not admit non-resident students to attend the Foxborough Public Schools. And so that is what's before you, is to make that vote, whether you are voting to keep the policy in place where we are not admitting, or that you would vote to um, enter into school choice. Okay, thank you. So, um, do we want to open up to discussion? I, I know, Mr. Ruder, you had had some thoughts on yes. school it, choice. Uh, well, I, my first thought is I would prefer, and this is more st just to give folks time to hear argument and, and, and have, it, have a discussion, I would prefer to table the vote to the next meeting. So like we're not butting up against, we're nowhere near butting up against the June 1st deadline. But. Um, it's just my preference that we get to hear and discuss policies on one night before voting for them. Okay. But if the if the committee feels differently, I can be swayed through sound argument. Okay. Mr. Pearson, Ms. Ladani, do you have any thoughts on the policy on choice on a decision or discussion? I, I um, 
I'm open to listening. That's the first thing I would I would say. So I could probably be swayed the other way, but I am not uh, inclined to change our policy. So yep. I could very easily motion at this meeting to not admit non-resident students. That that's where I sit, and that's my belief. Do you mind um, discuss? I mean, are, are you, do you mind just having that discussion? Because I know in the past we've yeah we could, we've, we've yeah. been able to go around the arguments for it just in, in, for anybody yeah. who's listening. Yeah, or we can wait till next meeting just to digest and wait. So I, I can do either way. Uh, Fine. Sarah, any know. any preference? I'm inclined to agree with Richard, just based on the reading the policy and knowing that that that's been what we've done in the past. But again, I see a valid point to what Brent is saying about maybe tabling it and having a discussion. So I, I'm I'm good either way. Okay. Okay. Um, Tabling it to the next meeting does what, Dr. Burrows? It's fine to table it to the next meeting. Um, I, I, if you want to ask a couple of questions based mm -hmm. on the past that might be helpful in thinking if you're going to table it to the next meeting, sure. uh, you know, I'm happy to answer some of those questions. And then also to understand what that means for anyone that might be listening at home. It's if you live in a different community, if you do not live in Foxborough, if you were to vote for school choice, it would then allow non-resident students to then enroll in Foxborough. You, they would then, if they enrolled at a particular grade level, let's say elementary, then they're able to stay until graduation. What the enrollment means as far as from a financial standpoint is that it's a $5,000 per pupil. The district um, that they would be coming from pays Foxborough $5,000. If they're a special education student, then it's, it's different um, as far as there's an increased cost there, but you have to go through and really look at what the service mm -hmm. delivery is by hours, and then there's a lot of filing. Um, we have Mr. Michael Azek here. He, can, he actually has experience um, with this in a former district, too, so I know that while he's here, if you had questions and wanted him to speak to that, sure. I'm sure that he'd be inclined to, to answer those. But if you think about our per pupil expenditure, we're, I, I haven't looked at it recently, but we're around $16,000. So $5,000 versus mm -hmm. to educate a student, there's quite the discrepancy that's there. I know from speaking with colleagues that um, do have school choice, it was done for a very specific reason. Um, in, in some cases, it was to be able to sustain their school system. And I know that we've talked about that here at this table before, and, and that's actually um, the district that Mr. Michael Isaac came from as well. And then at the same time, it's a matter of where do you have room in enrollment when you're thinking about students coming in. So one of the things that, that we look at and we talk about regularly here is the enrollment and how it fluctuates by the, the beautiful thing of having three elementary neighborhood schools is that um, you have three neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. But that can make it hard when you're adjusting. Sometimes you might have three third grade classes and then you go down to two third grade classes. So we're constantly looking at the enrollment and how that ebbs and flows. And at the same time, what we've experienced in the last several years is the number of students that are moving into the district versus that move out of the district. So one of the things that I did look at, um, because I, I was just more curious, because particularly at the IGO school, we've seen more of the move-ins, move-outs. So just as a, as a point of interest, at the IGO as an example, just since September, we've had 37 new students that move in. And we've had nine move out. That's just the IGO. When we look at um, the borough, so a small school, we've had 17 new students since September, and we've had six move out. At the Ahern, as an example, we've had 24 new students since the beginning of the year, and we've had 14 that have moved out. So you're seeing a net gain of students that are there. At the high school, 47 new students since September, but 39 have moved out. So I think it's really important for us to look at our enrollment data, because if you had something like school choice when students were to move in, they're here with us, but we still see the number of students that are still moving in even after the school year, and they are resident students. So there's a lot to consider, mm -hmm. is, is the point that I wanted to make there. When we look at our enrollment data of how that ebbs and flows, it's been pretty um, consistent at the elementary level. We've seen that decline um, in the last 10 years, and then, and then you see that kind of move up to the middle school level. But again, you see the fluctuation during the school year, and we're constantly making shifts, particularly with the three neighborhood schools, and 
teachers moving grade levels to be able to maintain our really good class sizes, which is a value of the community. Thank you. Thank you. A point I'd like to make, if I may, one of the things I was thinking about was that there is a very large housing project coming um, on Moore Street, mm -hmm. which will or may, you know, I'm assuming, impact enrollment. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but down the road. So that was something I was afraid when I looked at it and read the policy. I was a little nervous because I would never want to, it's just, I feel like it would be a hard bell to unring mm -hmm. if we said yes and then we found that enrollment was just crazy in this, you know, the Moore Street, um, ap you know, apartments and buildings and, you know, new homes are still being made and things like that. And if we ever got to a point where we were overcrowded, had to have higher class sizes, um, right. it just, that was sort of a point to me that maybe right now it would, you know, maybe right now it might make sense, but would it make sense in the long run? Mm -hmm. So that was some, just my own sort of thoughts, right. if and I can share them. Right, and this is something that you can year. stop on a, start or stop on a year by year basis. Right. So. But you, once you start, you, you have that student you can, until. You, can, you have that student, but right. you can say, yeah, we're not sure. doing it next for the next year. Yeah, you so can stop you can, the inflow. Correct. Um, okay, thank you. I think that my concern with this is just what you said. If it's 5,000 per student and our, our average expenditure is 16,000 per student, we know right now what our budgets are. Um, and you know, one of our responsibilities as a committee is to look at, is to you know, approve budget for the schools and that is a complete imbalance. Um, you know, and, and that, regardless of the opportunity within Foxborough schools, our responsibility to the community is about the finances of the schools. And that, that balance is, is, is the piece that says, I can't at, at this time say this is the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I can't either. So it's the most compelling argument for me from a budget perspective. Pretty, pretty straightforward to me. Uh, we have a responsibility to the committee to understand our budgeting and, and plan our budgeting for the town and for this community. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into school choice, I was in a school with school choice that had it. Uh, when you get into that situation, I think there's other compelling reasons that it happens in other schools. Uh, I know for a fact some schools are doing it for an influx of funding, mm -hmm. plain and that's simple, true. Mm -hmm. that, without question. Uh, I don't think that's the necessity here. Um, I also think we put a lot of things to bear for the resources that we that we commit our resources to, mm -hmm. and um, I don't find any compelling need to extend that to this uh, un unquantified resource. Is what I'm saying. It could be five, it could be ten, it could be twenty. And then you got them for the whole time, and it's never well, going to meet what we do. So I, I don't see the value in it. I just a point of information, community. Mr. Pearson. Though the the district does control the numbers. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they do. I just wanted that the it, the, the policy as it is in practice, the district on a year by year yeah. basis does control the numbers of inflow. Well, whatever numbers is, I, and I guess I should. I wasn't saying that is that it's not it's not predictable. It's the numbers we choose, whether it's five we choose or fifteen or twenty or right. thirty, whatever. So whatever number we choose, I don't know what the compelling reason would be for us to shift gears and commit those to other resources that aren't in our community and aren't taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Are there, um, d does anyone happen to know, because I, I don't, and I can look before the, the meeting where we do vote on it, um, which uh, districts near and around us do it? Does anybody happen to know? You know that was actually going to be my question. And that's fine. That's, it's easy enough to find. I think Mansfield recently passed that's it. That's what I thought. But, and, and that's that's new for them. Brand new. All of the districts pretty much, yeah. are, um, I know Norton has had it for a number of years. And my understanding, and Mr. Michael Isaac can answer to this as well, I believe it was more so in order to help get towards full day kindergarten. So it was a, it was a um, financial decision to be able to move towards full day kindergarten. Um, there, again, as one of you pointed out, there's a variety of reasons okay. that, that districts do. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Okay. So any other any good questions or clarifying points that Mr. Rudy that you'd like to make? No, not not at the moment. If I think of any in the next few hours, I'll I'll I'll, I'll send them via email to people who can uh, help me answer them. So. Okay. So, 
um, with the discussion tonight, we need to make a decision, do, do we want to vote or do we want to make a motion to table this vote until the next meeting? I, I'll make a motion that we do not admit non-resident students uh, in school choice to the Foxborough Public Schools. I'll second that. Okay. So we're, so we're, we're going to vote on the school choice tonight. Is, that's where we're going. If there's a motion on the floor, we okay. can vote on the floor. It. Okay. So let's all in favor. Okay. All against. And I'll, I'll abstain because okay. I, I, I'm just saying I don't like when we present a policy one night and vote on it that night. <laughs> I just think it's bad practice. That's my opinion. Okay. Good. It was my opinion when I was on ADCOM, and it's my opinion on school committee. Okay. <laughs> Unless we've had discussion before on any other policy that we pass, for new policies and edits, it makes sense. We have two readings separated by meetings, and there's a process to it. So that's just my preference. Okay. And that's the re that's the only reason I'm abstaining. Thank it's you. not apart from the policy. But, I, but I do take your points and information uh, to heart because. I do. I, it's, it's important. Mm -hmm. I, I do you. understand that, Brent. I, re I respect. I respect that view as well, too. Um, totally. This policy is clearer for me, so that's and that's fine. That, that's where it's in my head. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, the school vote to uh, school committee vote to approve Foxborough Public Schools policy manual. So this is an easy one. Okay. This is just a vote because you have a policy manual with all of the policies, mm -hmm. and it's a required annual vote that you just need to right. vote that you're going to continue with your policy manual. Right. <laughs> it's all the policies that are currently in place, correct? Correct. Right. Yes. Yes. There you go. yes. Right. But it just requires an annual mm -hmm. vote for that. Okay. Which our right. policy committee dutifully updates with yes. the help of central ad administration <laughs> right. yes. Yes. and legal does. counsel. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. So um, thank you. May we have a motion? I move that we. Um, continue the use of the current uh, Foxborough Public Schools policy manual as is currently in writing. Thank you. I okay. second. Thank you, Sarah. All in favor? Aye. There you go. Four zero zero. Thank you. Uh, next is the acceptance of a do of the donation from the Foxborough Touchdown Club. This is nice. Dr. Burroughs, again. Don donations are always I wonderful. Love this. This is there's nice. a reason why we always try to close with the donations, right? <laughs> this is nice. Yes, they're very appreciative. So as, as you know, many of our sports teams, through the um, very supportive boosters, they provide additional coaches. Mm -hmm. And that's what this donation is from the Touchdown Club for football, not to be... Um, really until November of mm -hmm. 2022 when we're back in football season. But it's for $2,000 from the Touchdown Club and it is for the purpose of an assistant coach to support that assistant coach for football. Thank you. Motion. <laughs> I move to accept <laughs> the generous donation um, of $2,000 to support assistant coaching um, from the Foxborough Touchdown Club. Thank you. Second. I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. We uh, graciously accept the donation for the Foxborough Touchdown Club. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, other matters? Any other matters this evening? Sarah. I have other matters. I love to talk about the wreck. You all know, I'd like to end on a happy note too. Uh, I'd like everyone to know, talking about getting back to normal, we have the Ties and Tiaras dance this Friday night. It is coming up. I'd like to say a big thank you to Renee Tachi, who has worked tirelessly to put this together. It is completely sold out with a waiting list, so I was told not to spend too much time <laughs> talking about it. Don't Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but I would like to say thank you very much to the NHS students, um, the National Honor Society students, came out with an overwhelming, when we asked for volunteers, we had 30. Ms. Bishop had to tell people if they had already hit their cap, they had to remove themselves <laughs> from the list. Because we had so many volunteers. And um, we did have confirmation students as well. Um, a lot of Foxborough uh, kids there. I think we have about 10 confirmation students coming to help with the event. So many hands make light work. It's gonna be, 
It's going to be great on Friday night. Quick shout out to a Southeastern student, uh, Luke Serrani, who did all the artwork on all of the centerpieces. He painted them all mm -hmm. to be auctioned off that night for Friends of Foxborough Rec. So um, a really big like shout out to all the kids. Like They really rallied around this event and um, Parks and Rec. But um, I was uh, told to tell people that we really need um, summer camp counselor summer camp is back in full swing we are um, you know they're hiring we're in big need of counselors so you know high school students college students you know <laughs> tell your friends spread the word it's a great way to spend a summer so thank there you, you go. Thank you, and I did see that. I think a shout out to you for, for your enthusiasm. Um, uh, really appreciate it um, every time when you, when you bring agenda items from them. So seriously, thank you. Thank you, because um, you embraced it, so thank you. I'll be there volunteering Friday night, too. With your tiara or your, or your tie? I'll, I'll decide that night okay. and let you know. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> no, no other matters. Thank you, thank you. Richard? I was just gonna do a, a thank you, shout out to all of our students at the high school and extracurricular activities. I just happened to finish up with uh, the state hockey tournament uh, just over the past few days and our hockey team was in the tournament, so it was basketball as well. But, but I think it's a general shout out. Uh, as we did the tournaments this year, it was just saying that while we're back, back to normal in so many ways, we hadn't been at the TD Garden for hockey for two years, so we're back at the TD Garden. <laughs> so I know all the kids that participated across the state were just psyched to be back. But I think the reach out to the entire uh, extra creativity community is, is, is real because we have cheerleaders competed, we had wrestlers, we had track people doing all their thing, and we also had the team sports. So uh, it just occurred to me this weekend when I was doing it across the state that how thankful I am to this community that we're back and we're active. Mm -hmm. um, and if we pay attention to the papers and what's going on, we'll see that our students in the extracurricular realm are very, very active and very successful. So a shout out to all of them for their great success. Okay. And Thank you. we're here. Thanks. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, I just want to point out the um, cheerleaders just got back from Florida. I believe they got third place at Nationals. Nationals. Awesome. So, I mean, amazing. Yep. Great job for the cheerleaders. Congratulations so, to the cheerleaders. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. You took one of mine, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jacob, any other, any other matters? No. You're good. Grace? Nothing that okay. I can think thank of. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Dr. Mello. Uh, I think I would just like to give a shout out to Mrs. Hendrickson. She is our math science curriculum director, K-8, to and all of the teachers who helped with our family science night. So talking about getting back to normal, we had record-breaking attendance to join uh, the Ahern cafeteria. I think we had 275 students attend the family science night, and it was overwhelmingly, wildly successful, and it just was a signal to us that people are ready just start engaging in these types of activities again. And it was a really fun night for everybody. And I just want to thank her. It's a lot to plan and organize. And she did a really nice job and the people who helped her. So thank you, Ms. Henderson. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Burdos. I'm just amazed at how quickly with spring arriving and time is flying, we have the end of next week is that marks the end of term three mm -hmm. for middle school and high school program of studies nights that will be taking place at the Ahern next week. So um, it's, it's, quite the momentum that has started. So it's exciting with spring and seeing more children outside as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to congratulate the cheerleader, so thank you for doing that because I might have forgotten. Um, I did also want to remind everyone, uh, Mr. Stanton left, but excuse me, uh, uh, Campbell left. Apologize. Uh, the IGO has their production of Winnie the Pooh coming up <laughs> April 1st and 2nd. Um, it's a beautiful poster on Facebook if you haven't seen it. I know the artist that did it. Um, so uh, that will be at the Marilyn Rodman Performing Arts Center um, on April 1st and 2nd. So good luck to all of the actors and the, uh, all the people behind, this, behind the scenes as well on that. Uh, and just a reminder again that some of the dates that you put up earlier today, so on the 24th um, in the media center at the high school from 2.45 to 3.15, there will be a meet and greet with the high school principal, the new, the new um, finalists high school, for right, the high school the principal. The finalists for the high school principal. And then on March 29th from 6 to 7 p.m., uh, Mr. Michael Azik, I didn't have a location for that. Virtual. Okay, virtual for um, any uh, resources through the Department of Public Health. Mental health. Mental health, yes. okay. 
Thank you very much. My notes are my handwriting. I actually do have an M there. Uh, it looks like a P, which tells you how good my handwriting is. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, anything else before we have a motion to adjourn? No. Then may we have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Thank Second. you very much. All in favor? Thank Everyone you. have a wonderful evening. Thank you thank so you much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.